Is our AI future more positive than even the most ambitious sci-fi writers imagine? I'm Tanya Hall for ZDNet and Tech Republic, and joining me is Max Tegmark, MIT professor and author of Life 3.0. Welcome, Max. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. What is the mission of the Future of Life Institute? We simply want the future of life to exist and to be as inspiring as possible. And I'm optimistic that we can create the really inspiring high-tech future, but only if we win the race between the growing power of our technology and the growing wisdom with which we manage this technology. And the challenge here is to switch strategies because we used to win this wisdom race by, by learning from mistakes, you know? First we invented fire, screwed up a bunch of times, and then we invented the fire extinguisher. But with more powerful technology, like nuclear weapons and future superhuman artificial intelligence, we don't want to learn from mistakes. It's much better to plan ahead and get things right the first time. That's our mission. What is artificial intelligence safety and why should we be researching it? AI safety is simply that wisdom we need to make sure that our AI systems are not just powerful, but that they actually benefit us, do what we want them to do. You know, we're putting AI in charge of ever more infrastructure and decisions that affect people's lives. So we have to transform today's buggy and hackable computers into robust AI systems that we can really trust. Because otherwise, all this shiny new technology we're making can malfunction and harm us or get hacked and be turned against us. When discussing how advanced AI can become dangerous, you say it, it isn't malice, but it's competence. Explain that. That's exactly right. Hollywood makes us worry about the wrong thing, some AI sort of turning evil. But you know, the reason that we have more power on this planet, we humans, than tigers do, isn't because we're stronger, but because we're smarter. So future super intelligent AI will give great power to whoever has it, a group of people, or, or maybe even, even itself. So the challenge is to make sure that that competence, that power, is aligned with what we want to happen. It was fine for, for you and me to be surrounded by more intelligent beings when we were little kids, because mommy and daddy had goals to be nice to us and help us flourish, right? And that means that as we make machines more powerful now, we have to not just focus on making them smart and capable, but also educate them like good parents and make sure that they can understand our goals, adopt our goals, and you know, retain our goals. And those are hard, three hard questions. If, if you take your future self-driving car to the airport and tell it to get there as fast as possible, and you arrive covered in vomit and chased by helicopters, and you're like, no, 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 that's not what I asked for. And it says, that's exactly what you asked for. You've appreciated now how hard it is to get machines to understand what you really want, right? And also, Anyone who has kids knows the difference between getting our children to understand what we want and for them to adopt these goals and actually do what we want. That's going to be at least as hard with machines. And finally, we want to make sure if machines get ever smarter that they don't just get bored with their goals of being nice to us. You know, the way my kids have gotten bored with playing with Legos, but that they retain them so that we always end up knowing that we're working, that AI is working for us and not against us. What are some of the common myths regarding artificial intelligence and what is actually closer to the truth? One common myth is that intelligence is something mysterious that can only exist inside of biological organisms like us, where the fact is it's all about information processing. This is what's given us the whole AI revolution, right? The insight that it doesn't matter whether the information is processed by carbon atoms and inside of neurons and brains or by silicon atoms inside of machines. It, and if you have machines that aren't limited by what fits through mommy's birth canal, you know, clearly we have the potential to make much smarter things than ourselves one day, which will either be, I think, the best thing or the worst thing ever to happen to humanity. And I want to work hard for the former. Disruptions occur when previously unrelated technologies converge, converge in unanticipated ways. What kind of disruption might occur if AI merges with biotechnology? 
Yeah, this is a great example of the need for this sort of wisdom development. If you look at bad accidents that have happened with technology in the past, there's very frequently just unanticipated consequences. Not that somebody or something was evil, but that we hadn't through carefully enough. And um, fortunately, thinking about uh, these unforeseen uh, consequences has a long tradition. It's called safety engineering at MIT where I work. Some people misunderstand this as Luddite scaremongering and trying to freak people out. But safety engineering is exactly why, for example, NASA successfully put people on the moon, because they thought through all of these things that could go wrong to make sure it went right. And this is exactly what we need to do as a community now with AI. Think through all the things that can go wrong to make sure they don't. And um, also, I think equally important is to have a more long-term vision for what we're trying to accomplish here, because If we don't pay attention and ask these questions, we're just in the process of trying to make ourselves obsolete as fast as possible, right? First, we made our muscles kind of somewhat obsolete with the Industrial Revolution, which worked fine because we educated ourselves and started working more with our brains. And now with AI, we're trying to make our brains obsolete. But surely we, we humans can be more ambitious than that and envision truly inspiring society where we flourish and we create all this wealth of AI and we share it so everyone gets better off. And we feel rather than redundant and unnecessary, we feel empowered by this and have this awesome future. But this is a challenge. Now, I often have students walking into my office asking for career advice. And I always ask them what vision they have for, for their future. And if all she can say is, oh, no, maybe I'll have cancer. Maybe I'll get murdered. Terrible strategy for career planning, right? But I feel we humans as a species are making exactly that mistake every time we go to the movies and watch something about the future. One dystopia after another, you know, Terminator, Blade Runner. We need positive visions because the more we can articulate a positive vision that we're all excited about, you know, the more likely we are to get there. I've interviewed entrepreneurs and scientists who seek to impart emotional intelligence to AI to drive sales, products, and services. What are the ethical issues around using AI to influence human behavior through emotions? Well, there's obviously a lot of ways in which you can just manipulate people in doing things that aren't in their own interest, buying things they don't need, or voting against their interests. We've already seen some, some stuff like this with Cambridge Analytica, for example. At the same time, there's also positive ways in which we can make technology manipulate us that sort of bring out the best in us. We, we do that every day when we have it. your alarm clock gets off, goes off as technology changing your behavior so you don't miss that important meeting and so on. And, and ideally, we can, we can one day make AI that is specifically designed with us in control, you know, to really help us be the person we want to be, rather than just manipulate it into something else. You break down AI, artificial intelligence, into three areas. Power, steering, and destination. Explain those. Yeah, if, if you have any technology that you want to be really ambitious with, it's not enough to just focus on making it powerful, right? You would never go into a kindergarten and say, hey kids, here are these really powerful hand grenades. Why don't you play with them? What could possibly go wrong, right? You also have to think about how to steer the technology, control it, and where you want to go with it. That's what we do when we send rockets to the moon and beyond. And that's, I think, metaphorically what we need to do is we make AI more powerful. The steering of AI is all the AI safety stuff we discussed. How do you make it not buggy? How do you make it not hackable? And then the destination is the question of what kind of society we're hoping to create. What sort of future do we want to wake up in in 50 years if machines can do all the job better and cheaper than us? And I, I think that there's been way too much emphasis in the media, in particular, on all the risks. Generally, because it's easier for us to think about all the ways we can screw up, right? Most religions have much more details on hell than on heaven for that reason. 
but it's incredibly important to, to, to just envision something positive. If, if it, and there is a lot to be positive about. Everything I love about intelligence, about society today is the product of intelligence, right? So if we can amplify our intelligence to cure all diseases, to figure out how to lift everybody out of poverty and make everybody free and have the opportunity to really live out their dreams on earth and if they want to elsewhere in the cosmos, you know, then life can really flourish, not just for the next election cycle, but for billions of years. And uh, there's no technology with more power to make these things happen than AI, because ultimately, so, so far, all the technology that we've built, all the inventions we made have been done with our intelligence. If we can make AI as capable as us, right, it unlocks the potential to develop all this other technology too dramatically faster than we ever dreamt of. And even the most ambitious sci-fi writers, I think, have been too pessimistic, actually, in, in terms of what's physically possible. Interesting take. Max Tegmark, MIT professor and author, author of Live 3.0. If somebody maybe wants a copy of your book, I certainly have one, or, or maybe they want to connect with you or take one of your classes, how can they do that? Well, if people want to have more insight into where this is all going and, and how they can make it work for them, my, I hope they'll find my book, Life 3.0, useful because I wrote it exactly for intelligent people who are just interested in this without having a very nerdy background like myself. And if they have questions after reading the book, they can email me, tagmark at mit.edu. Perfect. Thanks again so much for joining me. And if you guys want to find more of my interviews, you can do that right here on ZDNet or Tech Republic or go to my website, tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.